This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals like Stalking Hitler's Generals, when Allied commandos launch daring wartime missions to kill or capture German generals, and Secret Societies, organizations that play a far larger role in our everyday lives than most of us realize from the Illuminati to Freemasons and Skull and Bones. Go to curiositystream.com forward slash Mark Felton for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. And for our fans, use the promo code Mark Felton and you will save 25% off, which comes to only fourteen ninety nine a year. That's just $1.25 per month. For the very best in history programming, choose Curiosity Stream. Since the Russian invasion of Ukraine commenced, there has been much speculation as to whether NATO should directly involve itself in the conflict, and if so, how. A no-fly zone over Ukraine imposed by NATO jets is the most often discussed idea, and up to now, this has been shot down by politicians, defense chiefs, and analysts. Why? because such a move would inevitably lead to -to air-to-air combat between NATO and Russian jets, and to losses on both sides. It would also widen the conflict from Ukraine into a Europe-wide war, perhaps even a world war. The question is, will politicians U-turn and actually go down this path? And what would Russia's response be, for example, against the British Isles? The following program, based on defense analyst published reports, concerns a conventional and not a nuclear attack by Russia on Britain. Though the UK seems quite far away from Ukraine and Eastern Europe, Britain is vulnerable to a non-nuclear strike by Russia that could, according to defense analysts, rapidly erode Britain's ability to wage war on Russia. Several years ago, I made a video about how Russian military aircraft have returned to the old Cold War practice of loitering on the edges of British airspace. The Bear and Blackjack bombers on reconnaissance missions are chased away by RAF typhoons of the QRF, the Quick Reaction Force. But aside from the obvious nuclear option, could Russia attack Britain conventionally, essentially repeating the assault that Hitler's Luftwaffe made in 1940-41, an assault that caused widespread damage to military and civilian infrastructure and loss of life? The answer, according to defense analysts, is yes, and here's how. The air defense of the UK rests on a series of radar sites on coastal areas. This information is fed to the Air Surveillance and Control System at RAF Bulma. A handful of Typhoon aircraft are held in readiness to intercept threats. Two problems are immediately obvious. Firstly, though a very capable aircraft, the RAF doesn't have many Typhoons in service. If it comes to enforcing a no-fly zone over Ukraine, many RAF fighters will be forward deployed to airfields in Germany, Poland, Estonia, and so on. In fact, this process has already begun. How many aircraft could be retained to defend British airspace? Secondly, such a small number of aircraft would, in fact, have difficulty in intercepting and destroying multiple intruders, particularly the most likely form of intruders that Russia would use, cruise missiles. Russia has a series of very capable cruise missiles currently in service. They can be both nuclear or conventionally tipped, and can be launched from submarines or aircraft. A concerted attack by a couple of dozen cruise missiles at the same time would overwhelm the ability of typhoons to intercept and destroy them all. Britain has a very capable navy, but a very small navy, as successive governments have cut defence spending to the minimum. There are no dedicated anti-aircraft missile batteries protecting the eastern side of the UK, the responsibility of the Army. It has been suggested that two backups to the Quick Reaction Force would have to be used, a scattering of Royal Navy warships off the eastern coast using their integrated missile defence systems to engage and destroy incoming cruise missiles at sea. But again, just how many warships could Britain place into such a missile barrier and still meet its other commitments? 
there would be significant gaps in the same way that the handful of typhoons can't be everywhere at once. Another possible barrier I've just mentioned would be the setting up of Skysaver or Rapier missile batteries to protect key infrastructure and military bases from attack. Again, most of this equipment would probably forward deploy to support any NATO operations in Eastern Europe, and it's been doubted that sufficient is available to protect every important site in the British Isles. Further detection of incoming cruise missiles is possible using AWACS, airborne early warning aircraft, with their specialised radars. The small problem with this is that Britain doesn't have any AWACS aircraft at the moment. Indeed, our original E-3D aircraft, four of which were in service with the RAF, were retired at the end of 2021 and have yet to be replaced. The new aircraft, three Boeing E-7 Wedgetails, entering service in 2023. This leaves an enormous gap in our early warning capability exactly when it's most needed. But cruise missiles, due to the fact that they hug terrain and fly very low, are still difficult to spot, even with the best technology. So how would Russia deliver cruise missiles to British targets, and what would those targets be? The missiles can be delivered, as I've said, via submarine and or aircraft. Defence analysts have suggested that a missile-armed Russian submarine could pop up in the North Sea and fire off a single missile before submerging and repositioning itself. Others could also do the same, then change position and repeat. No Russian submarine would fire off a battery of missiles as it would leave it too vulnerable to interception by the Royal Navy or the RAF. But such attacks are feasible, according to experts. The second method involves air launch cruise missiles. The delivery system would be an aircraft type I've already mentioned that has been caught snooping around the edges of British airspace on multiple occasions over the past decade or so. The Tupolev Tu-160 Blackjack. The fastest heavy bomber ever flown, the Blackjack has a maximum speed of Mach 2.05 or 1,380 miles per hour at 40,000 feet. Russia is in the process of upgrading and expanding its fleet to a new Tu-160M2 variant. Currently Russia has 17 Blackjacks in service and 10 new variants on order. Each Blackjack can carry 12 cruise missiles and due to the missile's operating range of around 1,350 miles, could launch its weapons well beyond British airspace, the Blackjacks coming in to attack the UK via the far north, to avoid the agglomeration of NATO countries between the UK and Ukraine. So what would the Russians target? If you recall the 2003 invasion of Iraq, Russia would probably try to achieve two goals – Firstly, to write down Britain's air defences, and secondly, cause havoc and chaos by damaging vital national infrastructure. The first set of cruise missile targets might include the British radar sites that provide early warning of incoming threats, effectively poking out Britain's eyes. Also, RAF and US air bases in the UK would be in danger. These two strategies are very similar to the methods used by the Luftwaffe in 1940 during the Battle of Britain. Since the end of the Cold War, Britain has followed a doctrine of concentrating military and naval assets onto a smaller number of bases, in order to save money. There are just a handful of air bases handling RAF traffic, and causing sufficient damage at even one could imperil effective air defence and air operations more generally. For example, Britain concentrates its entire navy onto just three bases. Nearly all the submarines, due to being nuclear-powered, and some of them also nuclear-armed, are concentrated in just one specialised base at Faslane in Scotland, and they are not kept in bomb-proof bunkers like World War II German U-boats. One or two cruise missiles could wreak havoc. Regarding civilian infrastructure, Britain faces many of the same problems it faced in 1939-45. Britain is an island nation, dependent on importing huge amounts of food, manufactured items, energy, and many other things from abroad. All of this comes in via ship. Supermarkets have little food in reserve, and it's been calculated that disrupting the supply chain for even three or four days could mean food and fuel shortages. In fact, we've seen this regarding fuel shortages very recently. 
with civil unrest most probably to follow closely behind. Russian cruise missiles hitting container unloading facilities in major ports like Harwich or Felixstowe, or knocking down bridges that allow container trucks to move goods to supermarkets, or hitting fuel storage facilities could all have a catastrophic effect on the supply chain and civilian morale. An obvious target would be a power station or two, causing blackouts, the loss of vital electricity to shops, factories, hospitals, and so on. A combination of surgical cruise missile strikes against some of the military and civilian targets I've discussed could prove devastating. Another important point is the following. Since the end of the Cold War in 1991 and the threat of a Soviet nuclear or conventional attack on Western Europe, Britain has scrapped virtually all its civil defence capabilities. This leaves the UK at a disadvantage following any attack, as the population has no training in precautions and there is no system of warning of imminent attack and no proper shelters. There is also the case for the RAF, whose bases are now largely devoid of Cold War era bunkers and are very vulnerable to strikes. Defence analysts have raised the Russian cruise missile threat to the UK for years, because Russia could do all the things that I've outlined and more. So if politicians decide on a no-fly zone over Ukraine and war with Russia, firstly they must get their own house in order. Missile batteries must be deployed at all points of vital infrastructure, including radar sites, power stations, military bases and fuel storage sites. Sufficient Typhoon fighters must be retained in the UK to reinforce the QRF. More airborne early warning aircraft must be acquired to provide proper UK-wide coverage and existing Royal Navy assets deployed to sea to provide an anti-cruise missile screen to assist the QRF and land-based batteries, and civil defence organisations must be reactivated, the bunkers cleared out and re-equipped, and volunteers sought for training to deal with the chaos caused by even a moderate interruption to supply chains, civilian life and damage to military infrastructure. The cruise missile is difficult to kill, to quote one analyst, it must first be detected, and when sea skimming or terrain following, only sophisticated airborne or space based sensors able to distinguish against background clutter have much hope of providing coverage over a large area. And there is one other attack that will inevitably accompany the cruise missiles a cyber assault that would wreak havoc on our completely computer based lives. Many thanks for watching, please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon, details in the description box below.